Thanks for tuning in to Playbook Experts YouTube channel. I'm Greg De Palma filling in for Mark Lawrence. Uh, we were hoping to put together our first college basketball centric podcast for 2024 with the NFL season and, of course, college football season now in the books for 2023 officially with Kansas City's win over San Francisco. Uh, but unfortunately, Mark is uh, really uh, busy at work with the college basketball newsletter uh, that needs to come out for tomorrow. Uh, it's been a busy transition week, so uh, we're going to take a full week off. Mark's going to take the full week off and get ready ready uh, and 100% to go on college basketball next week. So we didn't want to wait two weeks to wrap up the Super Bowl, and that's why I'm here along with Jim Feist to wrap up Super Bowl 58. How's it going, Jim? Well, it was, it was a very profitable week. Let's say that. It was, yes. And, and the show that we did last week, we all were on the same side. Yep. Um, and for different reasons, but primarily, I think we were focused on the differences in coaching. And then it kind of, as you blend it down from the head coach down through the the issues that we talked about, it came down to the difference between Wilkes and Spagnola. And lo and behold, that's where it really came down to at the end. Um, the Spag Spagnola defense stood up through the overtime and San Francisco defenders looked like they ran out of gas. And um, of course, when you, when you're dealing with Purdy's a good quarterback and he may someday even be a little bit better than a good quarterback, but he is still young. And right now there's nobody in the league like Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. And when it comes down to that and their pedigree and their experience, and then you have Andy Reed, Spagnola, you got, they just had the little bit extra. Now, any play in the game could have changed the whole outcome yep. and may never have gotten to overtime. So it was really a toss up. Really, they tied the, they tied and one one went into um, um, it then went over into overtime. Yeah, it was really uh, I don't know. It, 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 for me, it's it's just a very strange Super Bowl because it was it wasn't very pretty. Let's just say what it is. I mean, there were turnovers. Uh, there wasn't a lot of great offensive plays. Uh, so, and then for three quarters, it it really wasn't very good. And then you got the excitement of the end and overtime. And even though it went to overtime, it's still you look back and you were like, I don't know. It just still felt like. Like you would think the second overtime Super Bowl ever would have just an unbelievable amount of with San Francisco and Kansas City. It would have so much, you know, uh, riding on it. And the country would be just at, at wit's end. It just didn't feel that way to me. I don't know why. Well, it did that. It did for me in the fourth quarter in the overtime. I mean, that was exciting. The first part of the game. And then to, even through the third quarter, it was kind of, you know, mundane. It wasn't exciting, but I enjoyed the fact that there was some good defensive play. And there's other parts of the game besides offense. And yes. I thought that the defensive play, even even though San Francisco fired Wilkes, I thought, he, I thought their def defense was pretty damn good for a while. I mean, they're going up against a very talented quarterback and, some talented players on the offensive side for Kansas City. So I give them credit for that. Now, granted, apparently uh, Shanahan and Wilkes had issues throughout the year, and, and that, that ended the relationship. But there's a lot of relationships that, that ended this week, and we're seeing a lot of fallout. In the next six months, you're going to see a lot more fallout. Who's going to be where, who's going to be coaching, who's going to be playing, all that stuff. It goes down to that, and it's not going to stop. Yeah, I, I mean, we didn't really talk about it, but that, I mean, if you look at it, this happens a lot. Like, you, you, and it's going on in Baltimore right now, where at some point, when you go to like your third coordinator, you're not going to just keep getting lucky with these big time hires, whether it's chemistry, whether it's just acumen, whatever you want to call it, because they went from Salah 
and then uh, and then you go to Ryan's, and then at some point, somebody just is is gonna have just he's not gonna be able to have that bar leveled or raised. And not that Wilkes did a bad job, but let's just remember what happened in the two playoff games before the Super Bowl. That defense was getting shredded by Green Bay and Detroit. They just did not perform very well. That team that team peaked early in the year, and they've started to regress throughout the last quarter of the year. Um, they, they just weren't the same. Um, it, you know, it's a long season. There's a lot of injuries. The team players get banged up. Even if they're still in the game, they're not feeling the same as they did in August and September when they started the season. Um, so we had one team that started to peak. As soon as they hit the playoffs, Kansas City started to peak. They beat Miami in a game, you know, that Miami was kind of out of their you know, comfort zone being in a, the freezing temperature. But then they went up to – and you got to give them credit. I mean, we went up to Buffalo and win. They go down to Baltimore and win. You know, I felt because of the way they played at the end of the season, in, I mean, specifically the playoffs, and then you look at the two bad games that I thought San Francisco had against Green Bay and Detroit – they had the wrong team favored. Yeah, I, I felt Kansas City should be the favorite. Not that, not that I would have. Uh, I mean, if Kansas City was a three-point favorite in the game, I would not have played it. You know what I'm saying? But the way the money was set up, and the they were looking to offset some of the future tickets. I'm talking about the books. Yep. Offset some of the future tickets they had on San Francisco by trying to get money on Kansas City uh, because. Quite honestly, I had a ticket on San Francisco back in July and August that didn't cash, but I didn't, and I probably would not have made that bet if I thought the team that they would meet in the Super Bowl would be someone that had all that pedigree going yeah. for them. You know, I, I never thought Kansas City was going to make it to the Super Bowl, sure. even in preseason. I didn't think that they had what they had needed, a wide receiver, et cetera, et cetera. But when you put together that coaching staff that they have, a decent offensive line, Kelsey, Mahomes, I mean, yeah, and they, they surprised me. If I would have known they were going to be there, I would not have bet San Francisco to win the Super Bowl. I, not that I would have bet Kansas City. I just would have sure. laid off of it. But at the end... When it comes down to Kansas City with that pedigree and that experience, and a basically a rookie quarterback going up against Mahomes, yeah, and a regression of San Francisco while Kansas City's climbing, they're regressing. Uh, you know, it, it just came down to that. Not that it was an easy victory; it no, could have gone either no, way. No, uh, but you know, when you go into overtime, you basically say these games were tied. The teams were tied. They tied yep. the game, and. And if they had ties like they used to have in the NFL, it would have been a tie game and that would have been the end of it. Yeah. But now they have to play to a winner, so you go, oh, to, yeah. the, you go to the overtime. Well, and, well, but what you were saying, Jim, I think is that what we were all thinking with Kansas City is that, because we, 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 preservedly so, we were looking at their offense. We Nobody expected their defense – to be just as valuable, if not more valuable this season in what they had to do to win the Super Bowl. Because without that defense performing as well as they did, they don't get to the Super Bowl. No. The, the defense surprised. I don't think I don't think anybody could have predicted that yeah. defense would have been like that good. Because at the end of the season, they were probably the best defense in football. Sure. Seemed like they played like it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, they... Not that Purdy is an experienced quarterback, I and mean, he he missed some shots in that game that he should have made, but he was under a lot of pressure too. When you got Jones coming up the middle in your face and you're missing a receiver in the end zone, yeah, but Jones is a guy you want to be a little scared of if he's coming right at you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but that defense really, Spagnola was to me coach of the year. That, that was he did the job to get that done. I'm not taking anything away from Andy Reid because he, he's been amazing for I don't know 25 years or whatever he's been around. It's been quite incredible. It'll be interesting to see now that he takes some time after the Super Bowl, uh, what he's going to do, Andy Reid. Now, even if he 
comes back another year. Let me see if I could do something no one's ever done. That kind of deal. You just get the feeling that he's, he's going to retire soon. And so Spagnola is going to get a chance with Patrick Mahomes still in his prime, you would believe, to be a head coach again and have a quarterback like Patrick Mahomes on the sideline. And, and, that, 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 if, and that might work out for the Chiefs. That, that could be a really nice transition. If he wants the job. True. You know, because you look at this, I mean, he, all the offensive and defensive coordinators that are any good are all getting shots at often to be a head coach, and he has not. Now, it almost seems like he's comfortable where he's at. He knows he's good at this. And, you know, it's like the old Peter principle. We all elevate to the position where we can't perform. And he he's had his shot, and he didn't feel comfortable with it. It's a much bigger job to be a head coach than it is to be a coordinator on one side of the football or the other, because there's so many other things that you have to deal with. And there's only 24 hours in the day. And as we get older, each hour becomes more difficult to, you know, to do the tasks that we once did. So um, he might just be comfortable in his position and in where he actually feels comfortable. Now, granted you get paid a lot more money when you're the head coach. So unless, I mean, they can always lure somebody out of a comfort zone to, to go for the money. But then again, you're, you're dealing with, okay, I'm an offensive co- or defensive coordinator in Kansas City, and I get a head coaching job in California. Well, I have a family, got grandparents, parents, children, grandchildren, you know, and maybe I don't want to be away from them and don't want to move all of them. And a lot of times it's not about the coach or the player. It's about his family or their family and where they want to be. And some so some people give up the situations. I mean, look at the, the offensive coordinator for Detroit. For some reason, he backed off to be a head coach. He said, I'm staying here. Why? I don't know that answer. But it could very well be you know, his wife, his mother-in-law, his mother. could be anything. It could be just he's comfortable doing that job and he didn't. You know, because you know damn well he was going to make more money if he went to sure. head coaching somewhere else. So He didn't find the right fit yet, and he's in no reason to rush and make a stupid move. And I know a lot of people thought he was going to Washington, but that's still an unknown. You have no idea how that's going to work out. Yeah, you, okay, owner, everything looks good. Yeah, they hired a really good up-and-coming GM. Okay, that looks good, but you never know. It's an unknown, and maybe he just felt... That just wasn't right. It wasn't the right gig for him. And, and why go into something that he just doesn't... And like you said, maybe there were some other factors that just, yeah, you know what? I got other things going on too. I'm not com- comfortable there. I don't have to take it. I, I can get a job next year. And maybe maybe he's got an eye on another job that we're not even thinking about. Maybe he's got, maybe he's got an eye on a job that will potentially open up that he goes, you know what? That's the job I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for. I just can't tell anybody. So... Well, yeah, I mean, and we can see that there are jobs out there where we might have thought maybe Chicago was going to change their head coach. They didn't. And that could fall apart and he could jump into that job as a head coach because, I mean, it's, first of all, it's in the same division um, and it's geographically close to living in Detroit. Living in Chicago, it's not that much of a difference. Um so it, it comes down to a lot of factors. I, I think Spagnola, though, I think if uh, if if Reed were to retire, uh, it would be such a great opportunity for him, uh, knowing that Patrick Mahomes would be his quarterback, and that uh, that I think could be the best uh, for uh, for the entire franchise. So we'll see what happens. Who knows? Maybe Andy Reid will hang on for another five years, for all I know. Um, I am glad to see Harbaugh go, go leave Michigan and go to the Chargers, and it's about time the Char- Chargers get a yes. quality. I mean, I remember when they had Marty Schottenheimer, who was absolutely a fast <laughs> coach. And um, I think they fired him when he was 14-2 and two because he didn't do well in the playoffs, yeah. which was absolutely ridiculous. But it's, uh, now they got they got a guy. They better not mess with Harbaugh because it's a tough turkey. He knows what he's doing. And stay out of his way. No meddling owners with him. No. I mean, like they have, I thought Tepper coming in for the Carolina Panthers was going to be a real plus because he's a real aggressive guy and he goes for it and he wants to win, et cetera, et cetera. But I didn't know that he was going to be a meddling owner. Too aggressive. 
Yeah. Yeah, he he, he might be he, not might be. He's take right now at this point he's taking too much power over the over the team and I hate when that happens. I mean Jerry Jones has done it for 25 years in Dallas and that team should definitely not have gone titleless for for a de- you know quarter of a decade. So and speaking of Washington's uh, situation, I mean quarter look, of a century I should say. I I just I, I'm not trying to sit here and tell you that um I don't think he deserves another shot because he came real close to winning a Super Bowl but um I don't know. That that just to me seemed like a lateral move. Like I don't know. If I'm a fan of Washington, I'm like, really? I thought we were well, going to get Johnson and, 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 and we get and the retread. You know, that's the label. Even though, like I said, you know, he's been a very good coordinator. Almost won a Super Bowl as a head coach. I think he's an upgrade. But then again, the last guy almost won a Super Bowl as a head coach. And it didn't work out. Quinn, Quinn has proven with Atlanta as a head coach, he did a hell of a job. And his offense with Ryan was, and, and um, Shanahan led the league in scoring. And they got to the Super Bowl up 28-3. to I don't know what the hell happened in that game. They absolutely went brainless. Um, easily could have ran out the clock a million different ways. Um, it was, They just lost their mind. And there's no way the Patriots should have won that game. I mean, give them credit, they did, and they made the plays when they had to because that's Brady, that's that's Brady and his team. I mean, they were that's who they like. But given the op, if if you take away the opportunity for them to have those plays, they're not going to make them, and they just didn't do that. And sometimes on offense, you got to play defense, and and they they just didn't do it. Greg, can can I take a break for a second? Sure. I got I got to take a break. Okay. I'll be ready. I got to answer the story. No, go right okay. ahead. Uh, yeah, go right ahead. Uh, okay. In the meanwhile, while Jim takes care of that, I am just going to remind everybody that starting next week, we are going to talk college basketball on the show. And um, if you take a look at it right now, matter of fact, I could pop up on the screen. Let's see. Where are we? Here we are. Uh, let's see. That's mine. Here is... Here are the latest college basketball tournament odds to win the national championship. UConn is and Purdue are the co favorites uh, from Draft Sharks from Dra- DraftKings, excuse me. Uh, which I'm sorry, but UConn's not winning back to back championships. It just does not happen, and it's not going to happen again. Uh, Purdue is trying to do what Virginia did. Everybody and, every, and and the thing is, is that everybody has said that like 500 times since it occurred last year, and that's why I just can't see it happening because everybody's looking at Purdue and just pointing to what happened to Virginia, and everybody is already on that, uh, you know, that uh, comparison. And I I just I don't know I don't know if I believe that I don't know if I believe Purdue because uh, they are similar to Virginia. The way that they, you know, play their game, and it's just a little bit different when you get. Obviously, it's a lot different when you get to March Madness compared to how you play in the regular season. Uh, but anyway, there you go. You've got teams like Purdue and Houston uh, making the transition to the Big Twelve has been awesome for them in basketball. Uh, Tennessee, Ricky Barnes. I mean, does this guy ever come up big in the postseason? Bruce Pearl's had a lot of uh, uh, you know down opportunities in the postseason. Arizona. Went quick in the postseason last year, so there, there's a, a lot of uncertainty in college basketball, and it should be a lot of fun when we start uh, diving into it on next week's show. So I was just going. How about, how about next? How about the tomorrow? Tomorrow's the game: UConn against Marquette. Yeah, there you go. That's a good e- one. Not e- sure. Either one of those teams could take it down. Yeah, and, I mean. By the way, I know that we don't cover f- women's college basketball. But hats off to Caitlin Clark. What she did, what if you ever saw this girl play? Uh-huh. It, it's absolutely amazing. How she's a talented young woman. That it's absolutely incredible what she did, does. Forty nine 
points, 13 assists, broke the scoring record for college female basketball players. Unbelievable. So that's uh, next week when we start talking about college basketball. Uh, but before we do that, um, let's make the transition from the – we were talking about that Atlanta New England Super Bowl to this Super Bowl because – First of all, some similarities. They both went to overtime. And the other similarity, uh, having Kyle Shanahan a part of both Super Bowls. So, there, you know, that's the talk. You know, you, matter of fact, here, I, I can, you can see down on the screen. I'm going to, uh, let me go over to YouTube and let me just type in Kyle Shanahan. There you go. And what pops up? The 49ers overtime decision. Mistake. Did Kyle Shanahan's overtime decision cost the 49ers Super Bowl? Uh, players react. Uh, everybody reacts. Uh, and that's the thing you were mentioning before, Jim, regarding how close the game is. And it wasn't like the Chiefs blew them out. I mean, as much as you, you felt, and I think a lot of people felt, that when Mahomes, at least when he, at least when he crossed midfield in overtime, that you, you kind of felt you know what was going to happen. The fact is, is that that was still a, it wasn't like Atlanta. This was still a San Francisco team that did just about any, everything they could have. And it wasn't like they, I, I think it's just is what people do when, when, when you lose the game. You got you to gotta try to pin, point a finger at somebody. Somebody's got to be to blame. You lost. So let's blame this. Let's blame that. They were just this close from winning the Super Bowl. And I just think it's one of those losing Super Bowl teams that doesn't have anything to be ashamed about. Well, they don't. I mean, there was a great game, and it was really an even even game. And when, when you go to overtime, that means you played even with the other team in regulation. It was an even game. But yes, there was mistakes made by both sides, of course. And the decision in overtime, if they go down and they score a touchdown, now Kansas City's got to come back and score a touchdown. That's and, a lot of pressure. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I don't I don't fault that at all. And by taking the, uh, taking the ball, he did give his defense a chance to rest a little bit more. Yep. I mean, I don't – these people that come up, they blame everything on everybody – Red boarding, everything. That's all crap. Yeah. You know, yeah, you can be right, but you can be wrong too. We're not, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, if he didn't take the ball it, and, and Kansas City scored the touchdown, now the pressure's on a rookie quarterback to come down and score a touchdown. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Give me a break. Um, and then they would have said, oh, you, why'd you take, the, why did you put your defense back out on oh, the field? They were so tired. And Yes, exactly. And, they got to stop this stuff. It was a great game. Yep. A little, a little slow first couple of quarters, but it came down to battling hard. They played hard. They did. Everybody did their job. Even Will, who got fired, did did a pretty damn good job. Yeah. Maybe he made a couple calls that Shanahan didn't like. But I'll go back to this. A couple of years ago, McVeigh took the Rams to the Super Bowl, and. Um, who, who's his the quarterback? Was um, oh, Goff. Oh, Goff. Goff. Yeah. So they lose that game. I think to the Patriots. To okay. Absolutely yeah. terrible game. Terrible game. Oh, that's got to be the, the worst Patriots. ever. Oh, horrible, horrible. And of course, whose fault was it? Well, why did? Why were they so bad? Why could they only score three points? Wasn't McVeigh's fault? Et cetera, et cetera. So McVeigh, <laughs> who I happen to like a lot, but I really do believe. He had to point the finger at somebody else, and he made Goff the fall guy, which yep. I think is bullshit. Yep. So you, instead of coaching him up and having him do the right things, you're going to blame him. And so McVeigh is McVeigh's the coach. McVeigh's the coach. It stops on his shoulders. He's the guy that didn't get it done. Not the quarterback, not the defensive coordinator, not the wide receiver. It's him. He didn't get it done. If he didn't have his guy ready, it's his fault. So he throws Goff under the bus. They make the trade, get lucky, get Stafford out there. They win the Super Bowl against Cincinnati, which they easily could have lost. But so he, he got away with it. He rolled the dice, blames Goff, gets Stafford, gets a Super Bowl victory. 
Goff is a good quarterback. <laughs> and you said, damn good. So I don't believe, you know, and here was with Shanahan, maybe he was going to get rid of Wilkes anyway. So he throws sure. and gets, gets yeah. rid of Wilkes. Fine. Maybe their personalities are different. Mm-hmm. Fine. But how many how many head coaches and quarterbacks have you seen go to the Super Bowl and lose consecutively? How about Buffalo? How about Minnesota? How, you know, we've had several people, even his father, I believe, lost a few Super Bowls. But, thank, I mean, God bless him. He's got to the Super Bowls three times yes. now. And twice as a head coach and once as a coordinator. He's damn good at what he does. Oh, well, that's not that's, what some of the analysts say. The seven analysts talking about how Kyle Shanahan's, uh, he's, he's a terrible head coach. You know, he, well, I don't, I, I don't yeah. believe that at all. I mean, for but Christ that's what sake. they're saying because he can't, you know, because he keeps losing these games in the Super Bowl. Excuse exactly. him for getting there. And the know? Chargers fired Marty Schottenheimer fourteen yeah. and two because he couldn't win in the playoffs. There's, there's a difference between winning the ultimate trophy and being a loser. They're not losers. No. They're just not guys that are going to win the championship at this moment in time. And maybe if, I mean, too bad Marty's passed on and couldn't sit here and defend himself because I think he was a fabulous coach and, and should have never been fired. But the, the Charger franchise has been a losing franchise for decades. And now, finally, they step up and get somebody that really could cause a problem in that division. Look at that division. That, they has, he has the talent. He's got the quarterback, and he knows how to win. Jim Harbaugh is a winner, and he's proven it in many places, and he will be tough to beat. Now, he's going to be in the same division as Kansas City. Yeah. It's... So it's going to be Andy Reid against Jim Harbaugh. You're gonna, I mean, this is this is going to be a battle in that division. It's not going to be easy. It's it's like, of course, when Jim Harbaugh decided to come back to the NFL, he was going to coach in the AFC. Would these coaches and quarterbacks and all the would they stop coming to the AFC, please? Can you even things out a little bit? I mean, the <laughs> AFC is super loaded and it just keeps loading up. I mean, you got Peyton coaching Denver. You got Harbaugh coaching the Chargers. It's like, unless there is, just imagine, this would be really fun, actually, because we didn't get an opportunity this season to experience it, but it would really be fun if a lot of these quarterbacks would stay healthy. It'd be fun to actually see the best of the best go up against the best of the best. Just imagine if Deshaun Watson was healthy in Cleveland and all the way down the line. It would just imagine these teams going up against each other in the regular season, the postseason. I mean, the NFC, San Francisco, Kyle Shanahan's real. They got it made right now. I mean, they just have to just keep winning, winning home field advantage every year, take care of business, and he's going to get his Super Bowl ring soon enough. Well, wait, wait a minute. I mean, we got a team right up the, right down the road, I should say, from San Francisco, and I mentioned of just a damn good coach and Sean McVay, and that is a good team, and they're got better at the end of the year. That. This is no cakewalk for San Francisco this coming year. Yeah, they need, that, but they need this, to find their uh, next quarterback though, because Stafford is still an, an injury away from well, missing time again. They, well, they all are. They all are. It's a tough position. He is a great quarterback, and he's proven it for. And he's a tough guy. He doesn't sit out when he's just hurt. He's got to be almost dead for him to sit out. He's a tough dude. I mean, twelve years in Detroit, <laughs> he's he's a tough dude. Uh, that's going to be that's no cakewalk there watch uh i I, I, you know i think if i'm going to make a prediction i haven't made this yet but i think uh if i'm if i'm going to predict where zach wilson is going to go i'm going to say it's going to be the rams i'm going to say sean mcveigh is going to get a hold of zach wilson and he's going to finish his development and by time stafford is ready to move on uh he'll have his next quarterback so zach is you know he has the size he has the arm the question is, can you get him really involved in the work effort and get his decision making under fire to be a little bit more precise? And because he has, if he has the desire, he definitely has the tools. The tools are there. Sure. But you got you got to develop the tools. I mean, they've got to be. 
And he's sitting in New York with the Jets, who is a losing franchise, great defense. Yeah. Sal is an yeah. extremely good def- defensive co- coordinator, but that's a bad organization, man. They, they haven't done very much for a long, long time. But if he goes to... If he goes with the Rams, somebody like that with an offensive mindset and yeah. coaches that can develop you, yes, you're right. He could be he could be dangerous. The question is: Is he does he have the desire? Does he want to put in the work? Oh, he does. He's then, from what I've then, heard. Yeah, he's he, he's he all has yeah. he has all the tools. Yeah, he definitely has all the tools. He didn't look so good in New York, but he has all the tools. So um, interesting enough that the Super Bowl result was three points again. So uh, is that two or three straight years of three-point results for the Super Bowl? Uh, that's a good one. I know it's two, but I don't know if it's three. And so uh, that might be a, a trend to keep an eye on. And the overtime, what is that? That's usually about eight to one, seven to one on the props. About- that's about right. Yeah. So that would have been a nice one. It's not easy to find a good prop where, I mean, we talked about that, matter of fact, last week. Where would be good props that actually had, you know, an opportunity to make money? And we brought up overtime being one of the very few. Uh, so, um, but again, that doesn't happen very often. Well, you're 58, there's 58 Super Bowls and only twice it's gone in overtime. That's yeah. A, that's really, you're talking about a long shot. It should be a lot more than eight to one. <laughs> that's true. Uh <laughs> What did you think then when you heard that some of the players on both teams weren't really, they didn't really understand the, the overtime rules? Well, I, I tell you what, if I'm, if I'm a player and I'm going into the biggest game of my <laughs> life, most likely, yeah, that's, that's bullshit. It's crap. It's, you know, it's, it's, you know, nobody told me, well, you're not a kid for God's sake. You're not in grade school. You're, You've gone through high school. You've played football all your life. You should know the damn rules. Everybody should know the rules. I mean, I, I hate when people just make excuses, lame excuses. These are people making fortunes to do what they do. Fortunes. They're, they're blessed to be in a situation and make millions of dollars to play a game. And then they're going to say, oh, I didn't know. Well, my goodness, guys. <laughs> you know, well, that's why I get a kick out of when you hear these football players, especially the former football players that will sit there with their nowadays, you know, everybody's got a podcast and they're sitting there talking about how, uh, well, this, these, you know, these, uh, these writers, these broadcasters, these analysts that have never played the game. They don't know. They don't know. They don't know. Well, here's an example of current football players that don't know that they don't even know overtime rules. So this nonsense about that you have to play the game. And if you haven't, then you don't know, we can't, I can't respect you as a, as an analyst or a broadcaster because you've never played the game. You don't understand. Well, that just puts it right back in their face that if you don't even know the overtime rules, because I remember Donovan McNabb once because those are the the earlier days of overtime and those rules. He had no clue, you know, when the whole idea about, you know, you score a touchdown and the other team doesn't get a shot or, you know, the whole way it is still in the regular season. I remember, I forget what it was, but I remember he was clueless the fact that, like, the game was over or something like that. And he even admitted it. He was like, I had no idea. And this was regular season overtime rules that everybody knew. So come on, we don't need to hear this nonsense. And I think this is just total proof that you, know, you can disrespect all you want. But the fact is, I think it's also comical that they get into the arena of a 30 or 40 year old uh, industry of someone that might be you know, a, a broadcaster. And that's what he's done for his entire career. And you get some athlete that just walks into the, a room with a mic and thinks he's more qualified to tell you about what's going on in the NFL than the guys that's been doing it for 40 years. I, I don't know what the truth is. I don't know what those coaches talked about to these players, but players are players. Sometimes you're in class and people, they're talking and they're teaching and they're explaining and you're just not paying attention. Maybe you got your earphones in and you're listening to music. And you <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. I mean, come on. What society are we living in here? 
I mean, these are young players. Some of them are 20, 25, you know, and then they have a cushy life and maybe they weren't listening or maybe they didn't understand. Maybe it wasn't explained right. But bottom line is Shanna had made the decision to take the ball. I can't fault them for that. You got defense that was tired. You're playing against the toughest quarterback in football these days in Mahomes. You need a little rest. You're chasing him. You're trying to get to him. You're trying to get a sack. And um, and it proved once he got back on the field down by three in overtime, he uh, he just took over. Legs, arm, he, he yep. just took over. It was him. And um, we might have had another overtime if he if they wouldn't have completed that pass. There was three seconds on the clock that had a kick. What did you think about uh, Travis Kelsey's incident? Because we all know what would have happened had the Chiefs lost the football game. That would have been all over the news. It would have been all over sports news. It would have been all over national news. It would have been major news had the Chiefs lost that football game. Well, you know, we, we hold... We hold people to very high standards. Uh, sometimes we don't hold ourselves to the highest standards, but we hold them to higher standards. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody gets caught up in the moment. If your adrenaline is going. You get pissed off because you're on the side. You should have been in for that play. Why, why am I standing here when I should be out there? I mean, it, you see, it's, it's human beings doing what human beings do, acting sometimes foolishly. It happens. We, you know, we, it's just the way it is. Humans are not perfect. They make mistakes. And uh, sometimes you get that rush, that adrenaline rush, and you just act like a stupid idiot. <laughs> you know, so he admitted he was out of line, and he was. But, you know, he's uh, he's got a lot going on right now in his life, and he didn't want to lose that game. And that's that's being competitive. I think the coach probably wants a lot of players that get that competitive and that much adrenaline to want to win that. And they, they probably shuffle it off slough it off and say, yeah, that's okay. Because I want my players to care that much. And I also wanted to kind of wrap up. And as we take a look ahead towards next season, to, to, to kind of think about as great as, you know, the defense for the Chiefs was, and you had Patrick Mahomes, and you, you can understand why they won the Super Bowl. I think it does have a reflection, sort of like when New England won the Super Bowl, if we go back to that one against Atlanta. I think what it told us that year, and I think this year, is that when the Chiefs won last year's Super Bowl, between that last year and this year, the league just hasn't caught up yet. There's just not enough. As And again, I think a lot of it had to do with some of the teams that were supposed to be really good in the AFC, had a lot of the quarterback injuries, things of that nature. But yes. it just wasn't a good enough year, talent-wise, in the NFL to catch up. So a team like the Chiefs were just able to win it again. Nobody's been able to get up there. And not just one team, but like three or four teams. And maybe San Francisco was the one team because Baltimore, you know, they, they were a major letdown uh, come that championship game and how they choked. But yeah, I just, I, I got to believe and hope that next year the league will catch up and we'll have uh, some more teams. Cause we talked about Detroit and green Bay, how they're going to, how they should look a lot better next year. And well, so, quite frankly, at, at, at the end of this year, um, Detroit might be better than San Francisco. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I mean, you know, it's – it's, yeah, granted. I mean, they have enough draft choices to, to build up that defense, which is what they have to do. But if they can keep that offense in, intact and Dan, Dan Campbell continues to roll the dice the way he does with, with a reasonable amount of success, I can't fault him for what he what he does because what he does got them there. and. It might be unconventional, and you may not agree with with him every time he does something. What a lot of people think is stupid, <laughs> it got him there. So somehow he got there. But you know, we talked about it all year long. At least 
I mean, I'm, I said it a million times. It's a down, it's a down period for the NFL. It's yeah. hard. They're replacing older quality quarterbacks with young kids that haven't developed. And you mentioned one of them, Zach, Zach Wilson. That's one. I mean, get, and then you come up with a, a gem in Stroud. It, it, where the hell did that come yep. from? Rookie coach, rookie quarterback. All of a sudden, they're in the playoffs. I mean, you never know when you're going to hit. And then you get the kid in, the, with the Panthers that a lot of people said he was just too small to begin with. And maybe he is. And maybe it'll take a very, very, very special set of circumstances to make him be able to succeed. Or, you know, maybe he'll be a, a surprise. We don't know. It's going through a phase. You're going going through changes. No longer do you have the the Dan Marinos and the you know the no. Jim Kellys and the the '93 draft. I mean, you're going through this stuff now. You're going through a whole new phase, and the offenses have all the rules in their favor over the defenses. But yet, the defense comes up in the Super Bowl, and they're they're probably more responsible to win it than anybody. So it's 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 hard to say. I and mean, they, they put the odds up, and San Francisco's still favored to win the Super Bowl. Well. You know, a lot of times Super Bowl losers go into a real funk the next year. That's right. And there are there are other teams in the NFC that are not absolutely terrible. I mean, Dallas is – I don't know that Dallas can ever get out of their own way as long <laughs> yeah. as Jerry Jones is, the, is, is coach, bo- cook, and bottle walker. I mean, you know, it's, I just don't know. But they have enough talent. I don't think Dak is – a a super quality quarterback. I think he's a B, a B quarterback, maybe a B plus. But yeah, they got to run the ball more. Well, I think they need a lot. Yeah, they 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 need a lot of help. And, and but the first thing is they need a coach that knows how to win. I mean, here's a guy in, in McCarthy that had Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers. He's he's got one Super Bowl. And he's got Dak. Dak Prescott. Um, I mean, these aren't terrible players. You would think he'd have done better, but and then look at what Philadelphia did this year. I mean, they were a disaster at the end. I don't know how the head coach didn't get fired there. Defending the way- Super Bowl runner-up. Yeah, and now we're going to have now we're going to have San Francisco in that yep. position. Now they're going to have to do something. In that division, you got Seattle in that division, and I don't know what the hell's going to happen there without Pete Carroll. That is true. That's that's. A we big know the question. defense is going to be better. Could be with Mike McDonald there. So what about what about their quarterback? You know, that's the thing. If you look at it, there are three. I believe only three old quarterbacks left. Aaron Rodgers, when he comes back next year, if he can make it more than four snaps. Um, Geno Smith and Kirk Cousins. I think those are considered the the, the older, oldie, because what are that? Geno's about, what, 33, 34, I think. And that's it. Everybody else is like around 30 or younger, if you take a look at around the rest of the league. So, well, Geno's been in the league about 12 years. He's had one good year. Yeah. So I mean, this, this year was, certainly wasn't a good year. Well, this is the year to draft... You can draft in the second round, the third round, fourth round. You can get yourself a quarterback, and you never know, especially and after what happened per, with Purdy. What's the, per, what's the percentage of a quarterback taken in the first two or three rounds out of college that actually becomes success in the NFL? can't be very high. I'm sure it's not, but this year is definitely considered one of the big years, and you're going to have three new rookie starting quarterbacks in the NFL this year. You're gonna have Jaden Daniels, Drake May, and Caleb Williams. So we have. So you just talk about the young guys. Well, we're gonna have three new rookies leading and, teams next and year. And the thing is, they all go to bad teams. That is true. Okay. So that's the one thing you take these high-quality quarterbacks in college, and now you put them on the worst possible team. Sometimes with the worst coaches, sometimes with the worst offensive lines, sometimes with the worst receivers. And now you're taking these kids who have no experience and you're putting them in the worst possible situation. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Patriots probably make out the best because they're going to, I think they, they're third, I believe. And they get to pick maybe Jaden Daniels, who I think is the best of them all. So uh, Patriots could be, could be a playoff team next year because Jaden Daniels can do what Stroud did, which is very possible. 
So um, taking a look at the odds, you got San Francisco right now as the favorite. And by the way, the Dallas 20 to 1. So they're not getting respect. The 20 to 1. They're, they're, you'd, have, you'd have to look at Dallas because Philadelphia seems to be a mess, and that's really the best contender they have. And they're 20 to 1. Division. I'd, I'd, I'd have to bet. I'm not a big fan of Jerry Jones and his meddling, but I'd have to bet 20 to 1 you have to take a shot because they should win that division. Chargers with Harbaugh and Herbert are 25 to 1. Well, they got but they have the, who do they have to contend with in that in that division? They got Mahomes to overcome that. <laughs> Rams are 35 to 1. Browns are 35 to 1. The, the, who's? The Browns. They get well, Deshaun Watson that, back next year with that yeah, defense. We, we still Deshaun Watson has to prove to me that he still wants to play. I mean, I, I haven't seen anything from him that gives me a lot of confidence that he really wants to go out there and play. They got lucky. They went down to their fourth quarterback, and he just came off the couch and did oh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's not going to happen. He's already taken a head coaching or a coaching job somewhere else, but but. Deshaun Watson, he has to prove to me that he actually wants to go out there every week and play. Because Ste- I don't know that he does. Steelers, if they could find a quarterback, they're 75-1. to 1. Well, There's a lot of talk about the Steelers going after um, the Chicago quarterback. Fields? Okay. I don't know. But, I don't. you know, that's another issue. The kid has a lot of talent, this, but he's not very accurate. Can you make him accurate? Uh, and then I mean, somebody, you have somebody has to coach him up to make him accurate. He's got to, he's got to get a little bit more accuracy. You're not going to win anything with 45 and 48 and 51 percent completion record. Now here's a total lack of uh, respect. Tampa Bay is 70 to one, while Atlanta is 35 to one. Are you? And they don't even have their quarterback yet. Atlanta. Wow, that's. Double the money, and you just won the division. You won a playoff game. You 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 lost to Detroit by a score, and you're seventy to one. And Atlanta is thirty five to one. I don't understand that one. Well, Atlanta has changed their head coach. Uh, Tampa Bay is settled. What the quarterback situation? The, well, they're going to they, have to give Baker Mayfield money, and they're going to do it. You know, they're going to do it. And if they pay him, who do they not pay? Because we have limitations sure. on, on on money. So that I mean, well, Mike Evans surface, is the big one. They have to hmm? decide if they're gonna they're gonna assign Mike Evans to his last big contract or not. I'm not gonna not downplay wide receivers, but there are a lot of wide receivers out there in college that are pretty look like they're pretty good. Oh, this is gonna be a stack draft for receivers. You're gonna get a ton of really quality receivers you, you, for the first you three may rounds. Not have to, you may not have to pay an older wide receiver a lot of money. You may be able to get something in the draft. All right. So as we segue over to next week, Jim, when we talk college basketball, um, how how much do you invest yourself in college basketball uh, between when the season starts and then now when the football season's over and you have more time to get into college basketball comparing that to March? How do you, how do you get into college basketball yourself in those three time periods? Well, first of all, I, I start college basketball before the end, before football is done. I'm I'm betting the first games in November back in back in November, and I have my own sets of power ratings at my my website jimfice.com. Fast facts, you can go there; it's free. You don't have to pay anything to get them. Um, and I use those. I analyze the games. I um, I bet every day. Of course. Now the conference tournaments are going to come up, and that is another whole world right there. Um, yeah, click on that. Go down to the – you'll see it right there. Well, click on it. Go to the day. Oh, click okay. on Fast Facts and then go to the day. Go to, well, Saturday won't be up yet because it's too early. It's, but Saturday will be up later today. You can go to today and get them. Yeah, there's your go. 
you know, right now you can page down to um, go down here a little bit more, a couple more spots. Uh, where the hell are you? We somehow you you went too far, too fast. You got to go back up. Look for the Niagara game against Fairfield. Oh, Niagara Fairfield. There it is. Yeah. And Niagara, you'll no, notice here, Niagara. I mean, they both have similar records: 11, 11, 11 14, 9. Power ratings say that Fairfield should be 6.7 or 8.5 favorites in this game. Where is but that? When you look here, you look here once over here with here? the fast, slow and fast over on the left side. Slow and fast. OK, slow. Okay. Okay. So when you look at when you look at the home and away records of this, Fairfield's three and seven against the spread at home. But Niagara's 10 and one on the road against the spread. Now, that doesn't have to hold up going forward. But let's go over here. And when you see last eight and last four, you'll see that in that these teams are playing kind of where they have been. Now, Niagara's had a couple players hurt the last few games, and if they don't come back 100% tonight, there's a little bit of an edge. So I got a, a team that's – and, you know, they're all going to go into their conference tournaments. So there's a lot of focus that might be going away from – these games, when they're looking two weeks from now, they're going to be playing the conference tournaments, and that's big. So, in this spot, I look at Niagara. They're taking the points. I got a shot at a good team on the road against Fairfield. Who Fairfield's a good team. They're not bad, fourteen and nine. But you know, these are competitive clubs, and um, it might take a spot there. I mean, this is a skinny card tonight. Yeah, Fridays but, always yeah, are. But, Fridays, but Saturday, Fridays for the Ivy League. <laughs> Saturday, Saturday's a monster card. We don't have the that's not up, but this is available every day. Everybody go look at it anytime they want to. Yeah. So, uh, do you have? And if you go over, look, just look under here. See the expanded glance right underneath Fairfield. Oh, yep. See, see that? Click on that. Now, page down, you'll see Niagara. This is Niagara's record. Okay. And it shows you everything you want. If you want numbers, I created this like almost. 55 years ago um and this whole thing and and it's it's quite elaborate there's nothing in the business like it that's awesome and being being a being a gambler somebody that bets on this stuff believe me this is valuable to me so do you have like right now do you have a team like if i pop up the uh, odds again is there a team here that and we'll start i tell you what we'll start right around here marquette and kansas well i'm kind of surprised kansas they haven't uh played as well as everybody thought they were from beginning to end but right around here you have like a team or two uh from 22 to 1 to like 80 to 1 that we should be that should, that's like a team that you've already kind of earmarked for the tournament that I'm going to keep an eye on that team come March Madness, especially if I see they have a favorable bracket. Well, the obvious, the Connecticut and Marquette. No, 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 no. I don't want to do the obvious ones. I want to do. Well, all right, gotta, we can start at Marquette. Gotta, Marquette's gotta twenty-two look, to one. You got to look at. You got to look at Houston. I mean, well, they're the obvious team. too. Give, give me, give That's, me some long shots. Uh, uh yeah, um, Dayton. Dayton, okay. A team, team like that. Um. There's a lot of teams that I mean, consider what consider what you got going on here. I mean, I'm going to go back to what we saw last night. Now, what Caitlin Clark, who's one of um, the female, but she can shoot the ice out of the basket. And and when you have one player on your team, like going way back to the Larry Bird days when they ran up against Michigan and and Magic Johnson, one guy on the team and gets hot and you can't stop them and they're three point shoot and they're just on fire seven out of ten three point shots and they can win games that they don't really shouldn't win but all of a sudden they get red hot okay so a lot of things like that can happen in in sports and especially when you put in that long shot issue of the three point play and what that does to your entire team and the defense. When the defense can't stop you from three point, that opens up the lanes, that opens up it for your big guys going to the basket. 
And if you're a, foul, a good foul shooting team, everything changes. So yeah, you can have some long shots go in there and do some damage. Well, I don't think I don't think you're going to see Purdue in the finals. I don't think so. Um, I know they're right up there at the top of the rankings and stuff, but I just I'm not confident in their play. Um, well, look at what happened last year. I mean, last year I think was the very beginning of what we're going to see. I think from now on in college basketball, I think we're, we're the, the days of oh, it's always these teams is over. I think you, the San Diego States, the FAUs. I think we're going to start seeing these teams make the Final Four. Uh, look at San Diego State last year. Yep. Now they tonight they play New Mexico. They're at home laying a half a dozen points against New Mexico. I think that's the spread, and and New Mexico is a damn good team the mountain west is dangerous yeah I mean, they, they they can and you got a you get a couple teams that you know you got the pac-12 with arizona and washington state playing pretty well washington but, state wow yes. you gotta love that right unbelievable that's unbelievable. a great story but you, you look at kentucky when you think about college basketball everybody said oh kentucky kentucky too because that goes back like 30 40 years it's always kentucky but you know calipari has never the way they're constructed, the way they put their team together, they're young. They play zero defense. You yep. can't, they can't stop anybody. Um, but when you look at UConn and Marquette, it's going to be hard to break away from the Big East when you've got teams like that. Well, the they're, good news is tough. Marquette's they're twenty-two tough. to one, and Pardon? UConn six to one. So big advantage if you're trying to make money uh, to take Marquette as a future, especially if you think they're every bit as good as UConn. There's or no you, value in taking or, UConn. Or you, or you could just roll over your bets. Just take a money line bet on the team you like and just keep rolling it. It's you're going to get a lot better than the odds that the odds making bookmakers are giving you. Because you're not going to get you're, you're going to get a lot better than twenty two to one if you roll over the bet. And it's been a long time since we've had a repeat champ, right? Florida was the last repeat champ, I believe. Everything's changed. We got the nil now. We got the we got the the transfer portals. Everything's changing. Everything changes. It's all different. Michigan State, they were supposed to be a top team, and they got off. To, they're off to a slow start. So maybe you yeah, keep but, an eye on Tom Izzo but, again. But but you got Izzo. You got some. He's a tough dude this time of year. Especially when you're counting him out. <laughs> yeah. That's the perfect time to take him. I I put money on him right now at fifty five to one. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, so this would be a lot of fun. We're going to start talking college basketball uh, next week. Looking forward to doing that right here on Playbook Experts. And uh, and then yeah, uh, it's, I tell you what, we're gonna have wall to wall coverage of March Madness. I promise you that we'll be doing because uh, 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 we'll definitely have some other shows. Matter of fact, uh, I'd love to get both you and or Mark on uh, Prime Sports Network. Maybe even uh, we do. Um, I know because you're gonna have coverage here on this channel, but I want to definitely break down the entire uh, bracket in college basketball. Uh, maybe uh, go over a list of really good. Uh, bracket busters, things like that. Uh, so it'll be a lot of fun, and I look for. And the thing is, it, it, it's not like football where you get the whole week. You got like twenty four hours where you have to come up with everything before the tournament. The end, you know, the the, the play in games occur. What is that? Tuesdays, Tuesday, Wednesday play in game, and then you got Thursday the first round. Uh, so we got twenty four hours to prepare. So Monday, very, very hectic. Yeah. Very hectic. So Monday, that'll be a really busy day of trying to put it all together and come up with a, a, some real cool videos that we can share with you guys to and, get you ready. And let me just say, what else am I doing? It's February, but in one month, we start baseball. That's right. And baseball has been an extremely profitable sport for me personally and my clients. There you go. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a grind. 162 games goes like forever. Yeah, I'm um, gonna I'm gonna definitely have you on my channel to talk baseball this year without question. We'll we'll get you on because uh, I want to take advantage of that uh, that expertise, make some money myself in baseball. Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday this coming week, uh, and probably Wednesday I will not be available. But Thursday, Friday, beyond that I will be. Have to take care of some personal business. Have a little travel to do and um are you going to be on the show next week friday right yes if, i mean if we don't change it it's friday yeah, yeah. Big shot. I, should, 
I should be able to do that Friday, two o'clock Eastern. Yep. I'm, I'm going to try. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll have Jim on next week. If not, if not, we'll do something. Maybe you and I early in the day before I have to get on a plane. Okay. If, if my, you know, if my flight interferes and then we can do something, you can plug it into the show. Sounds good. Appreciate it, Jim. Uh, that's the wrap on the football season. Next time we talk football, will most likely be to get ready for training camp and the preseason. Uh, so uh, it's on to baseball and basketball for the foreseeable future, Jim. Appreciate it, and uh, hopefully we'll see you on Friday. Okay, buddy. Thank you. Appreciate it.